Warning, this video contains themes of violence, death, and gang activity. This video is an educational documentary. It does not intend to glorify, incite, or encourage illegal behavior. All of the information is taken from public sources and is shown on the basis of fair use. I've made every effort to ensure accuracy of the sources, but I am not responsible for any content third parties have published. Every effort has been made to censor this video in accordance with YouTube's community guidelines, but if you want to see an uncut version of this video, you can do so on patreon.com slash traplawross. But if you're not interested in that, just hit the subscribe button and prepare to hear one of the craziest stories ever told. Sweden, the country that gave us ABBA and IKEA, is probably the last country you would think of when it comes to gangster rap. It's a country known for its stability and affordability, its safety, being rated number one for quality of life. Sweden has ranked number one on the Gender Equality Index. They provide universal health care and free education to the level that the United States can only dream of. It's a beautiful country with incredible nature and picturesque landscapes, but behind the surface lurks a dangerous underbelly. Because despite all of the positive things that Sweden has gotten right, it's a country with deep-seated problems. For example, the international media has sometimes paid attention to violence occurring in one particular spot of the country. The city of Malmö, in the southern tip of Sweden, which has since the early 2010s made headlines for having an unusually high number of shootings. However, tensions have risen to new highs in the mid-2010s following the so-called European refugee crisis, during which the liberal and desirable state of Sweden received the most asylum applications per capita in Europe. Over time, news and other media, particularly right-leaning ones, have begun publishing alarming reports of so-called no-go zones where even the police couldn't go due to out-of-control gang activity. Our next guest has just returned from a trip to Europe. He went over there because he wanted to see the migrant crisis firsthand for himself. He went to no-go zones in Sweden. I didn't think there were such places, but there are no-go zones where the police do not go. While he was there, he was jumped by five thugs. I went there, met with the police officers. They said, when we're pursuing a suspect, and they cross that threshold, and there's about 30 or 40 of them in Sweden, they will not pursue. I've just returned from Sweden, where something happened that I never would have imagined in such a wonderful country. My crew and I were attacked. We had things thrown at us, we were punched and kicked, and my cameraman was run over. Unfortunately, Sweden has become a victim of its own humanity. For all its generosity, Sweden is now grappling with communities of disaffected migrants who can't find jobs and have few prospects. There are now 55 declared no-go zones in Sweden where police have to escort ambulances to ensure their safety. Within minutes of us arriving, a group of young men make it clear we're not wanted and deliberately run down our cameraman. Whoops! That never hey. fun! Hey, 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 hey. Go on! And even they fear their presence will be provocative. Mm -hmm. I think it's better if you go in without us, because mm -hmm. I think it would be... Yeah, very aggressive. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Young. So, so do, and we will stay here, and if it is... You, you watch us. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Soon, it seemed that this violence and lawlessness had spread to the entire country, as reports circulated of teenagers roaming the streets of Sweden with rifles and shootouts had become commonplace. The right-wing politicians in Sweden and elsewhere were quick to take advantage of these news stories to push their hard-on immigration and crime policies. And even globally, right-wing politicians seek to capitalize on the issue, with Donald Trump himself even being particularly outspoken about the problems arising in Sweden. You look at what's happening last night in Sweden, Sweden. Who would believe this? Sweden. They took in large numbers. They're having problems like they never thought possible. I love Sweden. Great country, great people. I love Sweden. But they understand I'm right. The people over there understand I'm right. Take a look at what's happening in Sweden. To be fair, the more liberal and left-leaning media were equally quick to focus on dismantling these claims and suggesting that the problems had at least been greatly exaggerated, with senior figures in the Swedish police coming out to publicly denounce the existence of so-called no-go zones in the country. To me, I've been working in the, the, the most vulnerable areas in Stockholm. I've been working there for 18 years. We don't have a no-go zone in Stockholm. In my opinion, we don't have a no-go zone in Sweden. But this isn't a video about the migrant crisis. It's a video about gangsters. A 
and not dissimilar to the migration in the United States that saw Italian Americans establishing the Mafia there, in the years that followed the influx of people from all over the world, a new modern gang culture would emerge in Sweden, arguably with a heavy influence from gangster rap and drill music coming out of Chicago and London. Because as the years went on, reports about increasing violence, and particularly increasing gang-related violence, would unfortunately not go away, but become much more common in Sweden. From shooting high-caliber weapons into rivals' apartments, shootouts in the middle of the street, ghost-riding luxury cars for cover, drive-bys out of BMWs with AK-47s, brazen assassinations in packed restaurants, to turf wars between rival gangs that go far beyond shootouts, with gangsters literally blowing up their ops buildings. It happened to the residential area in Fulleru, north of the city of Uppsala. Investigators say the 25-year-old victim was a neighbour of the targeted premises and had no criminal links. Several other people were injured in two other blasts across the country, one in the south and one in a suburb of Stockholm. The attacks are said to be part of a long-running feud between two rival gangs in a turf war of drugs and weapons. Shootouts and bombings have become commonplace in part of the country, leaving the media, public and politicians asking themselves what can be done to stop the out-of-control gangs from waging war there. Going into the election year of 2022, gang violence became a hot-button issue for voters in Sweden, and even the left-leaning political party in power at the time was admitting that something had gone deeply wrong in the country. But that seemed to be too little, too late for the Swedish public. And now it was the right-wing parties, particularly the far-right party Sweden Democrats, who would end up coming out as a big winner at the elections and becoming the second largest party in Sweden. This enabled them to finally have direct government influence for the first time in the party's history, despite not officially becoming a government party. Now, much of the new government's policy initiatives would center around tougher immigration policies and introducing harsher sentences for gang members, including those who were underage. With the leader of the far-right party even suggesting that kids as young as 13 should be able to get a life sentence there. But by this time, the problem was deeply entrenched in Swedish culture, and the gangs in Sweden had already formed, being made up of youths who had moved to Sweden years, even decades ago, and in many cases, who had even been born in Sweden, representing the second or third generation of immigrants. And of course, as we all know, where there's gangsters struggling, it's only a matter of time before some of those gangsters become gangster rappers and begin using their music to tell the tale of their struggle in the streets. And in recent years, in connection to the rise of gang culture there, the new hot-button issue to emerge in Sweden is the popularity of gangster rap. As over these years of intense gang violence in the streets, emerging from those streets have been numerous gangster rappers, who have become mainstream names in the Swedish music scene all off the back of their alleged ties to serious criminal gangs. But after the genre's biggest star, rapper Einar, who had allegedly seemingly associated with several different gangs from the country, was first kidnapped by one of these gangs in 2020, and later shot to death in 2021 by unknown assailants in an execution-style attack that was also deemed gang-related. There has been much debate over what role do the rappers play in participating in and fueling the escalating gang culture in Sweden. And one of the more recent examples, in October 2023, Sweden was experiencing a particularly shocking wave of violence, apparently driven by one of the more prominent modern gangs, the Foxtrot Network, which the police suspect to be one of the country's leading drug distributors for the moment. They would fall into an all-out war against their enemies for the control of the country's drug trade, as well as going through a bloody internal conflict that has seemingly split the gang into two sides. And following a string of deadly shootings and bombings where numerous people had been killed, including a 13-year-old kid and the mother of a gang member. A rapper named 50, affiliated with the gang, would even go on Instagram Live together with one of the gang's alleged leaders, Benzema, who was allegedly hiding from the Swedish police in Iraq, and had even rumoured to have been dead, killed by hired assassins. However, this would turn out to be just a trick by Benzema to fool his ops, who he would taunt relentlessly in the video, while toting a gold-plated AK-47 and surrounded by similarly armed goons looking like a real-life character from GTA. Unfortunately for 50 and Benzema, their gangster lifestyle wouldn't last for long, because soon after, 50 and several other Foxtrot affiliates were arrested in Tunisia on gang-related charges. While for Benzema, the end would be even worse, because in January 2024, he would end up being assassinated in the middle of a busy street in Iraq, shot in his car just like he had faked his death only a few months earlier. With Swedish gangster rappers' connections to the criminal underworld being this blatant, it's no surprise then that much like in some other European countries, such as the UK, there have even been demands to censor gangster rap artists in the Swedish media. Meanwhile, other gangster rappers have announced that they are ending their music careers, concerned about the influence they're having on the youths, and tired of the mental load that comes with participating in this modern-day reality show that gangbanging has become online. So today, we're going to dig deep and look into the shocking untold story of the rise of gangs, and learn once and for all 
exactly how gangster rap turned Sweden upside down. Traveling a thousand miles from south to north, Sweden is rich in scenic variety. From the wide plains of the south, Sweden's amazing. It's incredible. The people are beautiful. They've got no trash. Their fish even tastes like candy. Like, <laughs> nothing bad ever happens there. Riots broke out in the Stockholm suburb. Just across the narrow waterway is the bustling traffic of the modern city. You look at what's happening last night in Sweden. Sweden. Who would believe this? Sweden. They took in large numbers. They're having problems like they never thought possible. There's always a friendly policeman to direct visitors to the point of interest. Sweden. And then a day later, I said, has anybody reported what's going on? We have many shootings and we have much mood. I want to come to that. And it turned out that they didn't not do many of them. Take a look. Take a look at what happened in Sweden. If you're 40, no-go zones in Swedish towns and cities. Correct. 30 to 40 of them. That's right. The country is experiencing some serious security issues. This is one of the brightest features of Sweden's social program is child welfare. Today, this old kingdom is a modern country. Yes, but in many ways it remains picturesque sweet. The Swedish hip-hop scene emerged in the 80s, shortly after the birth of the genre in New York in the late 70s, and Swedish hip-hop followed in the b-boy mould of New York hip-hop's original origins, firstly focusing on the pre-rap elements of the genre, like breakdancing, with some of these early hip-hop breakdance events in Stockholm showing the world that Sweden could get down with just as much talent as the New York b-boys. But at the end of the 1980s, pioneering rappers like MC Tim had emerged from the country, making history by becoming the first rapper in Sweden to ever drop a 12-inch hip-hop record in the native language. The end result was fairly respectful towards the original hip-hop culture, yet undoubtedly somewhat cringe-inducing if you look back at it these days. But the early rap scene in Sweden and other northern European countries was often defined by the native Caucasian Swedes trying to imitate the African-American scene, generally in a respectful manner. Now, in the 1980s, there were already many different ethnic minorities in Sweden, as the country was one of the first in Europe to adopt multiculturalism as a mainstream political ideology, in the years leading up to the hip-hop boom, implementing one of the most generous immigration policies in the continent. First, it was mostly work-based immigration, but in the 70s and 80s, this transformed as the country began receiving many refugees from all over the world. And in decades since, Sweden has actually taken one of the largest numbers of refugees per capita in Europe and the rest of the so-called Western world. And as demographic shifted, a diverse range of people from those minority groups would soon enter the budding Swedish rap scene and begin expressing themselves. It didn't take long for Swedes with multicultural backgrounds to begin representing the country musically all over the world, with Swedish artists such as Nina Cherry, who actually rapped in English, being one of the first to receive considerable popularity in the late 1980s, with songs that were surprisingly similar to the American pop rap scene. Perhaps in this case, with Cherry's diverse musical ability being the result of her stepfather being the established American jazz trumpeter Don Cherry and her biological father, Sierra Leonean actor and musician Amadou Jar. She would have early success with her first album, Raw Like Sushi, which actually peaked at number three on the UK albums charts, and she would go on to win two Grammy Awards, an MTV Award, and a Grammy nomination. Of course, in the 90s, Swedish pop acts would gain popularity globally, and a wave of Europop groups emerging from Sweden would find huge success all over the world. People like Ace of Bass and E-Type would represent Sweden's musical abilities globally. However, beyond the internationalized Swedish artists making music in English for the wider British and American audiences, in the midst of this pop music boom, there was one artist who would take Swedish rap all the way to the top of the Swedish charts. Mark Julio was a rapper of Finnish background who migrated to Sweden as a child, with his stage name being inspired by the American rapper Coolio mixed with his real name, Marco. 
releasing a string of hit albums and songs in Swedish which racked up many platinum plaques in the process. And while Mark Julio represented one of the biggest mainstream successes when it came to Swedish rap to emerge in the 90s, his music was more polished, tongue-in-cheek, and aligned with pop music rather than the gritty, authentic, and marginalized voices that pioneered American rap music. Now, earlier in the 90s, homegrown Swedish rap emerged with a more localized style and a connection to their equivalent of the streets. For example, the Latin Kings were a rap group of Swedish and South American backgrounds who made the charts with their 1994 album, which translates roughly to Welcome to the Suburbs, which popularized the use of so-called suburban Swedish, a multi-ethnic youth language adopted by the working class youth in the country. This dialect was born in the migrant-dominated suburbs in the outskirts of large cities like the capital Stockholm. The name of this dialect as suburban Swedish stems from the fact that unlike in the US where poorer and marginalized communities are often located in the inner cities, while the suburbs are generally safe places for the middle classes, in some European countries like Sweden, this setting is often reversed. And in Sweden's case, the country had actually built an enormous amount of public housing projects in the outskirts suburbs as part of their so-called Million program in the 60s and 70s. This was literally a political mission to provide a million new public housing units, a highly ambitious task which they actually succeeded in. I mean, that sounds like something the UK should do, to be honest. But anyway, it was in these suburbs that many of the new migrants eventually settled in Sweden, including most of the refugees who had fled there to safety, with many of these refugee communities often struggling with issues like unemployment and social exclusion. This would eventually create segregated neighborhoods where poor working class migrants would actually become the majorities. And it was in these communities where a new wave of authentic and real rappers began slowly emerging. Rappers whose backgrounds was much more reminiscent to the original oppressed communities who birthed the American American hip hop scene in inner city New York. One particular artist would actually end up playing a central role in truly popularizing Swedish rap music that was still faithful to the original American scene in style, while still being localized and authentic to the local Swedish culture. That rapper was called Petter. After dropping his debut album in 1998, he would go on to drop two albums that topped the charts in Sweden, as well as racking up a litany of platinum certified top 10 hits in the decades that followed. He would play an integral role in making rap music truly mainstream in Sweden kicking off a Swedish hip-hop boom at the end of the 90s and into the early noughties. However, despite rap becoming mainstream in Sweden throughout the 90s, also during this decade, underground rap circles began to grow, and subgenres such as so-called conscious rap would also gain popularity in the country. The rap group Loop Troop, or Loop Troop Rockers, made up of MC Promo and Supreme, as well as DJ turned producers MB and Cosmic. They would gain an audience in Sweden and abroad by rapping in English about graffiti culture, as well as police brutality, corruption, racism, and other socially critical topics with a Swedish lens. Since then, they've made a name for themselves in European underground circles for the last few decades. However, interestingly, as the decades went on and Sweden's demographics would slowly shift, partly due to the influx of migrants flocking to these suburban communities, rappers of a diverse range of backgrounds would ultimately emerge and increasingly reach the Swedish mainstream music culture. Artists such as Timbuktu, named after the city in Mali that his father hailed from, who would eventually drop a number one album in 2007, which I'm not even going to try and pronounce, there's also the Nigerian-born Ayo and Adam Tenster, whose father was from Gambia, but adopting a rap name derived from the suburb of Tenster in the outskirts of Stockholm where he hails from. This was yet another suburb that has recently become known for its escalating gang wars. Into the 2000s, the Swedish rap landscape would begin to look more and more diverse, with more breakout talent coming in the form of Eason and Phil and their crew, High One as well as people like Ken Ring and the rap group Labyrinth, whose rappers come from various backgrounds ranging from Chile, Palestine, and Serbia. The diversity in Swedish rap would extend beyond simply the heritage of the rappers themselves, as these rappers would commonly speak in their music about their hard upbringings in the million program suburbs, as well as criticizing the racism and exclusion of Swedish society that had apparently been directed towards minorities from these neighborhoods. But although gangs had certainly already begun to form in many of these areas, the music rarely, if ever, actually depicted the gang lifestyle. However, in the final year of the 2000s, one rap group emerged that changed this completely. That group was called Cartella, translating to The Cartel. This group would become famous for their provocative depictions of crime and social problems in the suburbs they grew up in. The story of Cartellen is a somewhat unusual one, but to make a long story short, the group was started by two lifelong Swedish criminals who were serving long sentences in Finnish prison for allegedly taking part in a murder plot. The group was made up of Leo Kinnison, which means Chinese, Carmona, of Swedish and Chilean background, and Jan Babyface Raninen, of Finnish and Swedish background. While in prison, Carmona decided to start a rap group in Sweden that would tell the stories of him and Raninen, the kind of stories about Sweden's criminal underworld that the country had never heard before in music. These were the true stories 
from their past lives of crime, including one of the largest robberies in Sweden's history in which Carmona was allegedly one of the three perpetrators in 2002, as well as the murder of one of Sweden's biggest mob bosses of the 90s, Dragan Josovic, whom Ranenen had apparently executed in cold blood during a horse racing event in 1998 whilst working as a hitman. This was an assassination which kick-started a violent Serbian gang war within Sweden. Ranenen received an eight-year sentence for the murder, which he only ended up serving a little over five years of, an incredibly low sentence that many thought was actually the result of his innocent looks, earning him the nickname Babyface. For the rap group Cartellen, Carmona recruited two rappers from their old stomping grounds in the suburbs of Stockholm, Seb Stax and Kaka, both of whom had lengthy criminal pasts. Now, this group was a winning combination, and Cartellen would go on to become extremely popular in the Swedish media and charts in the following years. However, at the time, they were clear exceptions in the Swedish rap scene, where many also thought that gangster rap just didn't fit in with Sweden's open and tolerant culture. This is actually reflected in a popular music video by The Carousel, a parody of the cartel that came out in 2012, which makes fun of Swedish gangster rap in this context. This skit would actually mock Swedish gangsters for wearing sunglasses in the winter and making light of their dental hygiene, a music video which even featured a cameo from the real cartel who pull up on them at the end of the video. <laughs> Now, at the beginning of the 2010s, true gangster rap in Sweden was still extremely niche. However, that would rapidly change after the drill music movement began spreading from Chicago to the rest of the world all around these times, with Chicago rappers' ultra-real and violent interpretation of gangster rap rapidly influencing the Swedish rap scene, as various artists would emerge trying their best to bring that Chirac energy to Sweden and showing the world just how real tourist areas like Stockholm could actually be beneath the surface. Interestingly, by 2018, amid the rise in Swedish gangster rap imitating Chicago drill, an unexpected face would enter the Swedish rap scene. The rapper Einar, a wholesome-looking 15-year-old teenager whose mother is actually an accomplished Swedish actress named Lena Nilsson. Although Einar didn't grow up in the public housing projects like most other Swedish gangster rappers, he did grow up in the Stockholm suburb of Enskededalen, where idyllic wooden houses in the south, like ones often seen in travel shows about Sweden, would meet working-class apartment buildings in the north. And these kind of hoods are actually where Einar can be seen hanging out with his friends in early music videos, particularly Enskededalen, or simply Dalen, a small district in Stockholm, which is also where one of Stockholm's most infamous gangs, the Dalen Network, allegedly takes its name from. Despite his mother's success, Einar's childhood was reportedly somewhat troubled, as he claims in his song Youngster with Extra Energy that he and his friends were up to no good from a young age, stealing scooters and selling drugs in school. Eventually, Einar would meet a man called Paddy. Now, that's his name, don't cancel me for that. But he would allegedly be a former leader of the Darlin Network gang, who would actually end up becoming Einar's manager, together with another alleged member of the network called Chapo. This street management duo would unfortunately meet a tragic end, when in 2018, Paki would be killed with allegations that Chapo was even responsible, with all of this ultimately leading to a trial where Chapo would beat the charges. With all of this going on, it's no wonder then that Einar himself was going through some difficult times. Einar's problem behaviour would eventually cause the social services to take him away from his family for six months, but this would do little to change his behaviour, and eventually he began carrying a gun and following in the path of gangsters that he had surrounded himself with. However, Einar had also been incredibly passionate about rap music since a very young age, and during these turbulent years of his life, clips would circulate online depicting the baby-faced teenager rapping in the studio and outside in the Swedish streets, with Einar putting the pain from his turbulent upbringing into his lyrics, suggesting that rap had always been his salvation in between spells as a drug dealer, with Einar ultimately inferring that rap music actually made him a millionaire. His career would absolutely explode in early 2019 after he dropped his gangster love song Katten, or Tracton, which translates to cat in this song meaning a girl from the hood. And he would also drop a music video for the track which was unmistakably gangster despite its romantic undertones. Although there were already some gangster rappers who were already getting popular before Einar, since his success, gangster rap in Sweden has truly become the sound of the mainstream, including rappers with real connections to some of the most violent gangs in the country. And as time has gone on, in the continued acceptance of drill music and culture in the mainstream, Swedish gangster rap has gotten far more violent, with firearms in music videos becoming commonplace and the gangbanging culture of the suburbs becoming a popular theme of the music there. Unfortunately, Einar's proximity to the streets would ultimately prove fatal. But in order to understand the deep connections between the music and the streets of Sweden, we've got to take a closer look at the hidden criminal underworld, and learn about the real and dangerous gangs operating beneath the surface in what's supposed to be one of the safest countries on Earth.
The wave of gangster rap in Sweden makes it seem like the gang problem has arrived in the country pretty much out of nowhere during the 2010s, and while to a certain extent you could argue that that's the case, the roots of the gang problems in Sweden go arguably much further into the past. Some concerns towards the social problems brewing in the Swedish suburbs have been discussed even internationally as far back as the 90s. For example, there's a 1998 article in the New York Times highlighting the ghettoization of a Stockholm suburb called Arinkaby, a place where the brutal gang war that we later discuss in this video actually begun. This was an article which ended with a bizarre romanticization of the hood, where a child would actually explain that the children all had stories about how their parents wouldn't let them party in Rinkaby and just how interesting they feel life is in these areas. Interestingly, some years Years later, in 2005, as France was dealing with large riots in their troubled suburbs, French newspapers were presenting Rinkeby as a model example for countries like France to follow. However, perhaps nobody could have predicted just how much things would later escalate, particularly during the 2010s. The Swedish police in 2019 would estimate that there were around 30,000 gang members and affiliates in the country. Now for context, in the UK, the country which is most often discussed when talking about a gang problem in Europe, there were approximately 33,500 so-called professional gang members in 2018. Now, this was considered to be a pretty large number, and according to The Guardian, this meant that there were more gangsters in Britain than in all three big Italian-American mafia families. But if you take a step back, and account for the fact that the UK's population is about six times the size of Sweden's, the numbers there become much more alarming. Statistics show that lethal violence in Sweden has also been steadily increasing since the early 2010s, but the somewhat moderate increase shown in this statistic tells only part of the problem. What makes the situation more alarming is that while other types of homicides have actually decreased, which has been a common progression in Europe, gun homicides in particular have grown so much that the overall trend of violence in Sweden has been increasing, with gun-related deaths deaths actually tripling between 2012 and 2020, taking Sweden from the very bottom of Europe's gun violence rankings to the very top. And now, only Albania, a country with decades-long issues with guns and deadly feuds that put the country ahead of even America in per capita gun deaths, leaving Albania as the only European country more deadly for gun crime than Sweden. But Albanian gangs, that's a whole other video. Again, to put Sweden's staggering number of guns in context, the Swedish police estimate that there are 3,000 illegal firearms in the country's capital of Stockholm alone, which is around three times the number of guns thought to be in London, which is a city around 10 times the population of Stockholm, and the per capita gun murder rate of the Swedish capital is about 30 times that of London. The great majority of the shootings in Sweden are connected to organised crime, with the new street gangs being largely to blame for this alarming increase. Particularly, statistics show how the rise in gun crime correlates with an increase in drug-related crime that most of the gangs apparently participate in. Moreover, the use of explosives by these gangs has also increased significantly, which has further resulted in numerous deaths, and horrific news stories that make Sweden seem like it's in a state of civil war. I woke up at 4.40 from a proper blast, and it was one of those, you know, rattling blasts, like... In Sweden, a woman has died after what police believe may be the latest in a series of explosions linked to a gang war. Investigators say the 25-year-old victim was a neighbour of the targeted premises and had no criminal links. Police think a grenade attack in Sweden which killed an 8-year-old boy could be linked to a gang-related conflict. Yusuf Wasami from Birmingham in the UK died when a hand grenade was thrown through the window of an apartment in Gothenburg. Police in Sweden say a man has died after picking up a suspected hand grenade in Stockholm. Swedish gangs have also been linked to shootings and murders in other countries like Denmark, Spain, Turkey and the United Kingdom. And the gangs are also actively trying to establish their operations abroad on a more permanent basis, particularly in the neighbouring countries of Norway and Finland where they likely have few rivals who could challenge them with equal levels of violence, as well as Spain where supposed Swedish narcos have migrated there to be closer to their wholesale suppliers that allow them to maintain and grow their drug dealing operations. As the gangs have become an inescapable capable part of the Swedish society, the media has also begun to make increasingly detailed reports about them, including dedicated sites like this one from the Swedish public service media company SVT, where each gang is presented in great detail. It's almost like a corporate version of Reddit's Shyrakology sub, which documents the daily goings-on among Chicago gang and drill communities. This particular site lists 29 gangs that have at least some operations in the greater Stockholm area, with some of the most well-known ones that we'll be discussing in this video being 
the Death Patrol, a gang that hails from the suburb of Rinkeby in northwest Sweden, a name which was first given to the gang by the media as seen in shocking reporting on the group being suspected of committing as many as 10 murders. The original members of the Death Patrol apparently called themselves 3MST, with the name being derived from the names of their most prominent members. 3 being 3M, referring to three founding members whose names begin with M, Mohammed, aka Makan or Makaleli, Mustafa, aka Musa, and Masla, aka Hajut. The S stands for Zachariah, aka Shobra, and the T for Abdis Ahmed, aka Talang, with some suggesting that the name 3MST actually stands for the Three Musketeers. But later, the abbreviation DP for Death Patrol would become a common name used to refer to the gang in internal Sweden. The Death Patrol formed in 2015, but has now been largely replaced by a new generation who have been given the new name, the Holster Children, referring to another suburb near Rinkeby. This new generation of the gang has also been referred to as the Death Patrol 2.0, or YDP, meaning Young Death Patrol, with this formatting actually borrowing a common UK gang tradition using the letter Y to refer to a younger generation of a famous gang. And shockingly, it wouldn't take long for news reports to suggest that the Death Patrol 2.0 was quickly becoming one of Stockholm's most violent groups. And now, in direct opposition to the Death Patrol, you have the Shotters, another gang from Rinkeby, infamous for their deadly feud with the Death Patrol that goes all the way back to 2015. This gang likely got its name from the classic 2002 gangster movie Shotters, which depicts two guys from the hard streets of Kingston, Jamaica, migrating to Miami in search for a better life. Some of the main names that have been associated with the Shotters are the brothers Far and Fay, aka Frankie, as well as Faisal, aka Indiana, A, Poi, Gucci, Hoods, and the rappers Yassin, formerly Yassin Bin, and Jafar Bin. Like the Death Patrol, the Shotters also have a younger generation who go by the name FLG or Filterlusa Grabar, which translates to something like the filterless guys, suggesting that in the streets, they truly have no filter. Later, the FLG would also have a split where some of the members would start a new gang called SSA, or Same Side Always. Now, as mentioned previously, there's another gang called the Darlin Network, which was allegedly the first gang that the rapper Einar became associated with as a youngster through a friend of his called Packy. That's his name, don't cancel me for that. At the time, this gang was likely operating mainly in the projects of an area called Darlin, including the suburbs around Enskida Darlin, where Einar grew up, and the neighbouring Bagar Mosun. However, recently, the gang has allegedly begun heavily expanding their operations across the country, leading to a violent turf war with another criminal group called the Foxtrot Network. That war reportedly begun in the city of Sundsvall. Allegedly, the gang's expansion has recently come under the leadership of a fresh-faced 25-year-old kingpin by the name of Mikhail the Greek, Tenezos. Tenezos has a warrant out for his arrest and is assumed to currently reside abroad, but his location is unknown. Now, the Darlin Network also has several rappers associated with the gang, including Thrife, aka Thrife Jack, who hails from the suburb of Enskeda Darlin and can be seen hanging out with Einar in the projects of Darlin in Einar's first music video. There is also Haval, who hails from the suburb of Skarpnyek, which is located near Enskeda Darlin, who can even be seen here posting with the former leader of the Darlin network, Mario Golzarmia, who is currently imprisoned for the kidnapping of Einar, among other serious charges. However, Haval has also been connected with another gang who are allied with the Darlin, the Vorbi Network. The Vorbi Network hails from the western outskirts of Greater Stockholm, unsurprisingly, a suburb called Vorbigor. The gang was allegedly founded by a man named Chihab Lamauri sometime in the late 2000s or early 2010s. According to the police, Lamauri is a strong leader who had organized the gang like a mafia with a strict vertical leadership structure. Besides Haval, the gang has been associated with the popular rapper Sikan, who often hangs out in Vorbi Gord in his music videos. This gang has had over a decade-long conflict with another gang from the same area called the May Network. This conflict stems from the early 2010s when there was another gang in the area called VYG, or Vorbi Young Gangsters. Although it's not clear if this was an actual criminal organization or just a fragmented group of out of control youngsters, what is known is that one of their members, named Mekil Yokana, was indeed serious about making a name for himself in the criminal underworld. In 2011, Yokana was shot in Vorbi but would fortunately survive, and it was rumoured that Lamauri's group was behind the shooting, which may have had something to do with territorial disputes regarding drug dealing. According to the local police, from this point forward, the Vorbi network, led by Lamauri, and the May network, founded by Yokana, were in serious conflict which would only escalate as time went on. After Yokana had been targeted in several assassination attempts, one of them injuring his wife and killing his friend, he would go on a retaliation mission that would become one of the biggest news stories in Sweden at the time. On the 2nd of August 2020, Yokana and his two accomplices would drive to a gas station with the aim of shooting members of the Vorbi network, but instead they would end up killing an innocent 12-year-old girl who was just out walking her dog. This tragic event caused a public uproar and eventually the men were found and arrested. And during the 
investigation, the police would also uncover that the murder weapon, an AK-47, had actually been used in a music video by an affiliated rapper called Tena, who himself had ties to the May network. The music video, which was for a song called Blue Cheese, has since been removed from the internet, and Ten An would end up receiving a four-year sentence for the illegal weapon. Initially, it appeared that the Vorby network would largely escape the situation scot-free, but soon it turned out that they were in fact suspects in another case that would end up making even more headlines. But more about that later on in the story. Together, the gangs discussed here have been part of some of the most brazen gang wars that have devastated Sweden's streets in the past few years, as well as blurring the lines between music and real-life organized crime in a way that has rarely been seen in Europe before. So now you know the key players and organizations that run the streets of Sweden, it's time to begin our deep dive into the violent streets of Sweden and the music that represents them. Going back almost 10 years to the Stockholm suburb of Rinkeby, where one dispute between childhood friends would ultimately lead to years of bloodshed that would eventually spread from the small suburb in the outskirts of Stockholm all the way beyond Sweden's borders and in the process, launching the career of one of Sweden's most popular rappers. Rinkeby is part of Stockholm's municipal district called Järva. This land used to be a military training ground until it was turned into residential areas as part of the Million program in the late 60s and early 70s. Originally targeting the growing working and middle classes in big cities like Stockholm, where housing shortages were a serious issue, over time the middle classes would move out of these areas to other neighborhoods with much larger single-family houses. This would leave only the poorest people in the Million program's projects, particularly the quickly growing migrant population. Nowadays, over 90% of Rinkeby's inhabitants have a migrant background, and over 50% of those are of African descent, particularly Somalian, a community which began arriving in Sweden as refugees after the start of the Somali Civil War in the late 80s and early 90s, leading to the suburbs of these areas sometimes being referred to as Little Mogadishu. Unfortunately, according to the Swedish police, many of Yerva's suburbs, including Rinkeby and the neighbouring Tensta and Husby, are at the top of Sweden's so-called vulnerable areas list. These are the areas that sometimes international media have erroneously labelled as no-go zones, but officially these are areas that have the highest levels of crime, poverty and general social exclusion from the broader society. Signs of serious social issues amongst Rinkeby's youth became public already in 2010 when large riots broke out in the suburb, and a few years later in 2013, similar riots started to spread to the neighbouring suburb of Husby, where at least 100 cars were burned, by this point with rioting spreading all over Stockholm. It's probably not surprising then that after drill culture began spreading from the troubled neighbourhoods of Chicago's south side all around the world in the early 2010s, that Yerva was one of the places where it took hold and inspired the local lost youths. In fact, one of the first rappers from the area to represent this style of music was an artist from the suburb of Husby called 24K, who would even use clips from the 2013 riots in his suburbs in his music music videos to paint a picture of what was going on in the area. This song, with a title translating to A Guy From The Program, would interestingly be an early showcase of some of the main enemies that we'll be discussing later in this story, showing that as often the case in these long-running drill conflicts, there was once a time when they were all friends, appearing together in the same music videos. Here you can see two guys from the Death Patrol and two guys from the Shotters. Masla from Death Patrol being the guy in the middle who raises a finger to his lips, along with Makalele from Death Patrol directly to the left of him wearing a black hoodie, while Hamza from the Shotters is to the left of him and Faye from the Shotters is there all the way to the right. This is a link up that would later become unthinkable as these groups would descend into an all out gang war. Now a few different youths from Rinkaby would also begin releasing music around this time under a movement that was called BBE or Bin Block Entertainment. Bin commonly being a nickname for Rinkaby, meaning the village. The most known rappers from this movement are Jafar Bin and Yasin Bin, the latter also making a cameo in 24K's earlier music video. These two would both later become affiliated with the group The Shotters, but long before that gang war had emerged, they would begin dropping UK drill inspired street freestyles and ciphers around 2014. Now, their influence came much more from the UK gangster road rap and drill rap scene, which had already begun forming in the years earlier. This is actually something that was mentioned in Jafar Bin's 2015 song Ghetto Style, where he says F Swedish hip hop, what he's doing is more like the UK, going on to shout out legends of UK street rap like Rimsey, Nines, and Jay Spades. However, in the mid 2010s, the youngsters from Rinkaby were not just rapping about the street life. While they weren't yet hardened gang leaders, they were commonly getting involved in various criminal activities, such as robberies and drug dealing. In 2015, one particular robbery would end up causing friction between a friend group that would lead to a years-long war and would end up claiming numerous young lives. A falling out that would lead to the formation of an infamous gang that would end up sowing fear all over Northern Europe and even beyond. On 
the 22nd of July 2015, in the suburb of Terby, about 20 minutes drive from Rinkaby, a group of at least four individuals pulled a heist at Forex Exchange, getting away with cash worth about 200,000 US dollars. This was a major lick that everybody was soon talking about in the streets of Rinkaby. By the end of that day, word had spread that a 19-year-old guy called Izzy had allegedly been the main culprit behind the operation. However, there had originally been others involved in planning this robbery. One of these guys was a 16-year-old Masla. But for whatever reason, Masla was not invited to the heist itself, which led to him feeling betrayed by Izzy for carrying the robbery out without him. Masla's friends were sharing his anger, namely Makalele, Musa, Shobra, and Talang. After the robbery that they were cut out of, they went to confront Izzy. They would end up meeting him near a subway station in Rinkaby, where things would soon escalate eventually leading to the group taking Izzy to a nearby wooded area where one of them would end up shooting Izzy in the back while he was trying to escape through the woods. Izzy was able to stumble through the small forest, ending up in the suburb of Bromston, which is a middle-class neighborhood. Just for reference, this is like an upmarket area which is worlds apart from the projects of Rinkaby. And it's here in this upmarket neighborhood that Izzy would ultimately collapse in the yard of an older couple who would phone for help. Unfortunately, later that night, Izzy would pass away in the hospital. A 19-year-old man died in the night after the witness was as a shot in Westerort. Enligt Aftonbladet.se ska tre skott ha avlossats i skogen mellan Rinkeby och Bromsten och 19-åringen ska ha träffats i ryggen. Polisen har inlett en förundersökning om mord. And this event would cause the large group of childhood friends of all different ages to split into two. Those who stood with Masla, who had been cut out of the robbery, and those on the inside, who had been closer to Izzy. Masla's group of close friends, who called themselves the Free MST, which included that core group of Makan, aka Makalele, Musa, Shobra, and Talang, this is the group that would eventually be labelled the Death Patrol. Meanwhile, the friends of Izzy would eventually begin using the name Shotters for their rival crew. But these labels for these groups wouldn't become prominent until some years later. And in the immediate aftermath of the death of Izzy, people close to him would go on the warpath vowing to get revenge. According to later reports, the murder of Izzy acted as a watershed moment in Rinkaby gang politics, where youths formerly concerned mainly of hustling and petty crime would begin commonly carrying guns and eventually even having to wear bulletproof vests. Reports would also tell that Masla and his friends went into hiding following the shooting due to the police likely looking for them as persons of interest. Although it's not been known for sure who had ultimately been the one responsible for pulling the trigger and killing Izzy, Masla would reportedly make a call to his mother soon after Izzy's death, telling her that he feared that people were after him and that they wanted him dead. And these fears turned out to be valid, because not even 48 hours later, Masla and his friends were ambushed at a gas station in the middle of the night. Unfortunately, Masla was shot in the head and later pronounced dead at hospital. The police and the Swedish media were quickly drawing a connection between both of these murders, and security camera footage from the scene would show two possible suspects running away from the gas station. The police would eventually find some compelling evidence pointing to Izzy's two older brothers as being involved in the murder, but they were eventually excluded from the investigation without ever being charged due to lack of evidence. In an act of reconciliation by the families and the broader Rinkaby community, both Izzy and Masla were buried next to each other. But this post-murder gesture would do little to calm down the escalating situation between these former friends now at war. Meanwhile, Masla's friends like Makalele, Musa, Shobra, and Talang were soon caught out of town in connection with another completely unrelated investigation. So for the time being, this crew was momentarily broken up as many of those involved were sent to so-called special youth detention centers since there are no youth prisons in Sweden. Now, this is because the government are apparently aiming to reduce the detrimental effects of time spent in prison by young people. Now, let's see how that turns out over the course of the rest of this story. But the sentences in these centres are relatively short, and already by the end of 2015, these gang comrades would all be reunited, and then they would continue to commit crimes, including robberies, home invasions, carjackings, and drug dealing. Now, eventually, all of those crimes would land these members in full-blown adult prisons, briefly lowering the temperature in the streets of Rinkaby. But soon, the war on those streets would heat up, and these gangs would pass the point of no return. By late 2016, while the infamous Death Patrol Quartet had been locked up, Izzy's friends, who had begun calling themselves the Shotters, had started to take over the streets of Rinkaby. Also, musical artists from Rinkaby, who would eventually become associated with the Shotters, were also on the rise. But at this point, they were still largely staying impartial to the brewing feud in the streets. For example, Yassin's rap career was blowing up. Already in 2015, he had signed his first record deal and dropped his first official single, the self-titled track, Yassin. Then, in 2016, Yassin, together with Jafar Bin and other rappers from the Yorva suburbs, created a rap collective called Ghetto Superstars, which began creating some significant buzz in the national scene. Besides Jafar and Yassin, the collective would also include rappers like Blizzy, Dree Low from Husby, Monty B, Elias Abbas from Rinkaby, as well as ZE from Tenster. 
some of these guys like Drilo and ZE would end up becoming some of the biggest rappers in Sweden. Also in 2016, Yasin would release one of his most popular songs, a track with the title translating to My Hood, together with a music video directed by acclaimed director Saga Berlin, who has also directed the music video for the song Tabanya by another Rinkaby based artist called Cherie. Now, both of these music videos provide an excellent window into the world of Rinkaby at this time, with high quality on the ground and drone footage showcasing the brutalist architecture in these suburbs in all of its glory. For the first time, the music coming out of these areas was giving the world and the country a window into life in the suburbs. Jafar Bin, on the other hand, who still in 2015 was shouting out Shobra, one of the core members of Death Patrol in his songs, would actually end up taking the shotter's side in the beef in the years following the death of Izzy, and this taking of sides would also be reflected in his music, eventually landing him in hot water with the Death Patrol. But before the beef would escalate to the next level, during the summer and fall of 2016, Makaleli, Musa, Shobra and Talang had gone free once again. However, they hadn't been seen in Rinkaby, as they had reportedly been banned from the area by Shota's members and were spending time in the city of Malma instead, making contacts in the streets there. However, they still had allies in Rinkaby who acted as their eyes and ears back on their native block. But while that was going on, the Shotters, who had lost many of their members as a result of a number of arrests after a recent large robbery, put them at a disadvantage in the streets. On the evening of December the 2nd, an alleged member of the Shotters, called Indiana, along with his brother Smokey, were at a local cafe in Rinkaby, without realizing that a friend of their ops had eyes on them. Suddenly out of nowhere, an automatic machine gun would spray up the windows of the cafe, making people inside hit the floor and panic. Indiana and Smokey would react fast, running into the back of the cafe in an attempt to escape through a back door. Unfortunately, they would end up getting trapped in the wrong room. Unable to escape, the gunmen would rush into the cafe, shooting both brothers, leaving them dead on the spot. After this brazen double murder, the situation would turn tense as many people gathered around, even acting hostile towards the police at the scene of the crime. Unsurprisingly, following this incident, the police would once again struggle to catch any of the suspects following the murders, partly due to witnesses of the event either being vague about who and what they had seen, or plainly uncooperative. I guess the no snitching rule applies in Sweden too. In reality, many of the locals likely knew very well just who had been behind this brutal attack, but many were scared to share any information with the authorities. A week later, these two murdered brothers were laid to rest in front of a large crowd and media presence. And at this point, the Swedish media were already reporting on how every 10th homicide in the country was linked to the suburbs of Yerva. Unfortunately, despite the police not being able to catch anyone, in the streets, revenge would come swiftly. Only about two weeks after the double murder, Musa would check himself in at a hospital in Stockholm with gunshot wounds to his lower body. Fortunately, he had worn a bulletproof vest that had stopped shots hitting his upper body, likely saving his life. Police would later gather that he had been targeted at a parking garage in the suburbs of Hulsta, near Rinkeby, in the early morning hours. Once police arrived at the crime scene, Musa had already left for the hospital, but at the scene, they would find two AK-47s and a car full of bullet holes with at least 40 shell casings. Unfortunately, Musa had returned to Stockholm with one of their new friends from Malmö, a man named Atto, aka A2, who was connected to gang members in Malmö who would later be known as Los Suecos, or the Swedes, a crew of contract killers who murdered numerous people in Spain. Atto was also an alleged drug dealer with connections on both sides of the conflict in Rinkeby. Those connections would end up costing him his life, as later that day, Atto would allegedly end up meeting a guy called a from the Shotter's side to allegedly collect a debt owed to him by Indiana, who had just been killed. Security cameras would reportedly capture Atto walking with A and another guy to a wooded area when Atto was suddenly shot, after which A and the other man would continue walking as if nothing had happened, leaving Atto seriously injured on the ground. The next day, he would unfortunately pass away from his injuries while the police would arrest A and his friend for questioning. But despite the police seemingly knowing exactly how these latest murders were a result of the death of Izzy in 2015, there was once again not enough evidence to to charge A or anybody else, making this yet another unsolved case in a growing list of unsolved shootings in the city. Meanwhile, following Atto's death, the locals in Yerva had had enough of the killing, and they would gather for a demonstration against the escalating violence. Sadly, this wouldn't make a difference, and it wouldn't take long from here for the bloodshed in the streets to begin spilling into the music. Going into 2017, the gang war on the streets of Sweden had passed the point of no return, forcing everyone involved in the former friend group to choose a side. But interestingly, as violence continued to play out on the streets, 
the budding gangster rap scene was continuing to flourish. In February, rapper Jafar Bin dropped his debut album, Ghetto Celebrity. The album starts with the song Gold Rush, where Jafar raps a seemingly ambiguous line, 33 shots in 3 seconds, with the line being accompanied by a sound effect of an automatic rifle. In Rinkaby, this was taken as a clear diss towards Musa, who had not too long ago survived such a hail of bullets when he was ambushed in the parking garage in Hulster. Elsewhere, in another song that translates to I Say a Prayer, Jafar also raps together with the tensed rapper Z.E. from their Ghetto Superstars collective about the effect that the death of Izzy had on them, with Z.E. rapping about how losing Izzy left him with deep wounds while Jafar seemingly describes his last meeting with Izzy after the Forex robbery, describing seeing Izzy and his accomplices with an apparent 2 million Swedish krona in cash, with Jafar implying that Izzy had even predicted that he would end up in jail or dying by the gun. Then, some months later in July, Jafar features on another rapper's song which translates to No Man's Land, where he mentions one of the main members of Shotter's, Faye or Frankie, who was locked up at the time, implying how Faye had told him that once he gets out, the Shotters will rule Rinkaby. However, there was a problem. The Shotters had been weakened by all the recent arrests targeting their members, and Jafar was getting himself involved in a war against an increasingly brutal gang. A few months earlier in April, a man named Nabil Haidar had been killed execution-style in the city of Uppsala, about an hour north of Stockholm. Haidar had alleged connections to Uppsala's criminal underworld, as well as many enemies, and members of the Death Patrol had now allegedly broadened their criminal enterprise and taken part in their first contract killing. The group was also allegedly tightening their grip on the drug markets around Rinkaby. At this point, they would now have the money to bring in large quantities of dope and a deadly reputation as a group not to be messed with. Their reputation would further gain infamy as the Swedish news media would in May for the first time introduce this gang under the name Death Patrol in an article which discussed an alleged 10 murders committed by this group at this point. Then, one day in August, the main members of the Death Patrol, including Makaleli and Musa, would catch Jafar after he left his home. After catching him, they would record a video G-checking him, seemingly threatening him with a gun, beating him, and forcing Jafar on his knees to the ground. And then the video would turn into one of the most disrespectful things I've ever seen done to a rapper in any video I've ever covered, and that includes Chicago. These members of the Death Patrol would punch and kick Jafar whilst dissing him on camera, and then they would go on to film themselves into his face as they continue to beat him. This was a disturbing act of humiliation, which would unfortunately become a trend in Swedish gang politics going forward. During this confrontation, they would continually ask Jafar where his friend Yassin was, before saying that they would get all of the Shotter's affiliated rappers, one by one. Soon after this event, clips of this video were published on social media, with people on a popular Swedish online forum flashback soon discussing and collecting these clips, with frenzied comments all about this infamous gang supposedly behind the attack describing them as the craziest gang in the entire village, with some even claiming that the OG gangsters in the area respect these bloodthirsty youngsters and that they are all wanted by the Swedish police. Soon after, also the mainstream news were covering this event, describing this incident as an abuse attack on a Swedish rapper. Jafar would also post his own response, where he would explain how the incident happened due to the lyrics on his song Gold Rush. Soon after the video leaked, people on the flashback forum would begin posting that Jafar's brother had responded to the attackers, threatening them by writing that when he sees them, it's on sight, together with gun emojis. These so-called humiliation robberies have become increasingly common in Sweden in recent years, with other rappers being targeted as well. And according to some, as a result of the country's immigration policies, according to rumours on the flashback forum, and later reportedly confirmed by police reports, McCann, aka Makalele, would actually end up running into Yassin that summer, beating him unconscious outside of a fast food spot in Rinkaby. After being beaten up and humiliated, both Shotter's affiliates, Jafar and Yassin, begun reportedly getting much more involved in the gang lifestyle. As can be seen in pictures taken in September 2017, the police later found in a confiscated phone where Jafar, who can be seen wearing a white hoodie, is pictured holding an automatic rifle, as well as later photos taken by police after Jafar had been arrested where he had been out wearing a bulletproof vest. At this point, the disrespect had gone to new levels, completely unimaginable at the start of this beef, and those rappers who were gang affiliated would begin to get more and more deeply entrenched in the ongoing gang war bringing yet more violence and police attention to the growing gangster rap scene in Sweden. By fall 2017, the police in Stockholm were beginning to take the war between the Shotters and the Death Patrol much more seriously. 
particularly the core members of the Death Patrol, whose every move were being followed closely by the police, as well as the growing mass of Swedish gangster rap fans. During this time, these gangsters would travel within Sweden, as well as abroad in different countries, such as the UK, Spain, and the Netherlands, where they were either spending their street and rap money on vacations, flexing their jet set lifestyles on social media, or, as the police were increasingly suspecting, doing international deals to further the success of their illicit enterprise. They were also allegedly creating new contacts with other gangs in Sweden, such as the terrifying hit squad, the so-called Headshot League, also known as the Tenster Network. In October 2017, police would move in and arrest the core members of the gang for the contract killing of Nabil. However, once again, there seemingly wasn't enough evidence to charge them. And in the end, everyone was let go, even Shobra, DNA was even found on the murder weapon according to prosecutors. However, before all of the Death Patrol members were freed, their rival, the Shotters, would take advantage of their absence and make a move, targeting the little brother of Masla, one of the deceased three MST members who originally founded the group that eventually became the Death Patrol. Nicknamed Machiavelli after Tupac's famous pseudonym, he had become involved with the Death Patrol after his brother's death. On the 23rd of October, Shotter's members ambushed Machiavelli in Rinkaby and shot him with an automatic rifle. Fortunately, due to his bulletproof vest, Machiavelli only received mild injuries, and soon the media would get wind of the shooting being connected to the Death Patrol and reporting on this feud being responsible for a dozen murders at this point. It seemed that the war was heating up once more and the media were reporting on the violence as it happened. But then, during the final months of 2017, the Swedish police seemed to finally get a breakthrough in shutting down the Death Patrol's activities. First, they would reportedly catch Makaleli, aka Maka, who they would find in the backseat of his girlfriend's car, armed with a hand gun and a bulletproof vest. He would end up being slapped with a one year and four month prison sentence for traffic, weapons and drug charges. Then, not much later, the police would catch Musa and Talang in a car near Rinkaby after a high speed chase. On Musa, the police would find an open phone that had information that ended up leading them to a large drug bust, catching dozens of kilos of amphetamines as well as thousands of ecstasy pills. Once again, the media was quick to report on their new favourite gang and the enormous bust that had been made, but the members would deny the charges. And once again, despite the best efforts of the Swedish authorities, it wouldn't take long for the Death Patrol and their ops to bring bloody violence back to the streets of Sweden. At last, the police seemed to have caught a break, and three core members of the Death Patrol were at least momentarily taken off of the streets. Meanwhile, the fourth major player in the gang, Shobra, had escaped the situation to Spain. Here, the Death Patrol had reportedly established some major connections with local criminal organisations. However, this meant that their associates in the streets of Rinkaby would be left without their enforcers. One of these was a young man named Kara, who was an old friend of Masla. Kara had been convicted in 2015 of another robbery which had been carried out around the same time as the infamous Forex robbery, where Masla had in fact been one of the suspects. Kara was apparently also close with Masla's little brother, Machiavelli, and had recently even been the person who drove him to the hospital after he had been shot. Now, it was this association that very well may have put him on the shot as hit list, because on New Year's Eve, Kara was found dead in a parking garage in Rinkaby, having been shot eight times, including in the head and dying at the scene. In the days that followed, Kara's friends and family would create a memorial for him at the site of the murder, with the core members of the Death Patrol off the streets for the time being and another one of their associates dead. It seemed at this point that the deadly war for Sweden's streets was tipping in the Shotter's favour, but the younger members of the Death Patrol were desperate to prove themselves to the older guys like Makaleli that they had what it takes to become so-called 100 guys. This is a term used to describe loyal, young soldiers who were ready to do four years in a closed youth home for committing an underage homicide. They knew that the Swedish state wouldn't punish these younger members for acts of violence, and they would carry their willingness to crash out as a badge of honour. About a week after Kara's death, on the 8th of January 2018, Schotter's affiliate Hamza, also known as Peps, was hanging out at Rinkaby Centre. According to some, Hamza was not much involved with the gang life, which is why he actually felt safe hanging out in the middle of Rinkaby. The police would later find out some interesting messages that his girlfriend had sent him, suggesting that even she wanted to be part of the alluring gang lifestyle. There were also rumours circulating that Hamza had actually given the location of Karar to Shotter's members before his murder, which had ultimately made him a target. After hanging out in the centre of town for some time, Hamza went to eat at a local pizza place, where he would meet some friends. However, at this point, Hamza had seemingly been followed by affiliates of the Death Patrol, including people who were already inside of the restaurant. Then, at around 7.30pm, security cameras would capture somebody walking confidently into the pizza place, entering the door just as somebody else was exiting. 
At this point, they would immediately raise a handgun, shooting Hamza twice in the head and neck, and immediately running away. Soon after the brazen execution, photos taken of Hamza's lifeless body would begin spreading on social media, and the news would begin to report of both the murder and the fact that the gang war had continued to play out on social media. The police were first suspecting Carol's older brother for the murder, and they started surveilling and tapping his phone where they would hear him imply that he'd had something to do with it. Catching him making the ominous statement, just as they took one from me, I took one from them, and vowing to continue to get it back in blood for his gang. While being surveilled, Carol's brother would have a meeting with a man named Dumla. This was a Death Patrol affiliate who would later become a notorious figure in the gang, along with a 16-year-old boy named Shaki, who was one of the young people in Rinkaby allegedly selling drugs for the Death Patrol. Looking into Shaki, the police would find interesting similarities with the shooter, including matching gloves and shoes. Further search warrants on different locations would also uncover a cache of serious firearms, one of them actually turning out to be the murder weapon where Shaki's DNA was also found. Police would also find messages between Shaki and the core members of the Death Patrol, indicating that the underage boy was used as a contract killer by the gang, knowing that he would receive a much shorter sentence, earning him the status as a 100 guy. At least partly due to the huge disparity in adult and underage sentencing, using these so-called child soldiers would increasingly become common amongst Sweden's gangsters. Shaki would eventually be found guilty, becoming the first to actually be convicted of murder in this war that had so far claimed so many lives. But, of course, as an underage offender, he would only receive three years in a closed youth home, even one year less than the four-year maximum. In many ways, Sweden's liberal and empathetic approach to crime was creating an obstacle to the authorities tackling the serious violence playing out on their streets. But ironically, it would take the war spilling into a neighbouring country for the perpetrators to be punished with the full force of the law. But for the time being, the Swedish authorities would continue their losing battle, as they would continue to attempt to get some of the most high-profile gangster rappers off of the streets. While this was all going on, Shotter's rappers Jafar Bin and Yassin were increasingly getting involved in the conflict in the streets, and they were actively using their music to taunt their ops. In December 2017, Jafar released a song called Shotter's, where he raps in depth about the deaths of Indiana and his brother Smokey that had happened a year before. He would also shout out other Shotter's members and threatening their ops for a major revenge that was coming, going as far as to say that he will kill 10 people to get back for his brother's deaths. In January 2018, however, Jafar was unaware that the police had begun to tap his phone as well. And during one phone call, he and others would admit that they were driving around, armed and ready to slide, causing the police to tail them and perform a stop and search. But the car would momentarily get away, and when police finally did stop them, there were no guns in the car to be found. However, Jafar had clearly not realised at this point that his phone was still under surveillance, and he would later explain during another phone call where exactly the guns had been thrown out during their getaway. The police would ultimately find these guns, and even more guns, that were hidden in a garage, including the automatic rifle that he was holding in the picture the police had found on a phone. In the end, Jafar would also end up getting a full year sentence after being caught in this sting operation. But this setback wouldn't seemingly diminish his commitment to the gang, as can be seen from his later letters sent from prison, where he would vow his loyalty to the shotters and writing lyrics about his plans for revenge, saying if you stand in my way, you will be buried shortly, we will take revenge. In March 2018, not long after Jafar's run-ins with the police that had turned into a lengthy prison sentence, a detective from the Stockholm Police's new gang unit, Team 2022, were at a gas station, when he saw Yassin in a car together with Shotter's members Poi and Faye. During the encounter, Poi would attempt to run off, in the process pulling out a gun, forcing the detective to fire his gun before throwing his gun to the ground and surrendering. Meanwhile, Yassin would also take off, but the police would later find a gun that the rapper had tossed away during his escape. This incident would make Yassin a wanted man, and when he found out the police were on his tail, he would make a brazen post on social media, posting a picture of himself with a designer scarf covering his face, along with the text, catch me if you can, along with hashtag FTP, fuck the police. While hiding out from the police, Yassin was still creating a big buzz in the Swedish rap scene, and he would capitalise on comparisons to other American drill rappers who had evaded the law by dropping a new song and music video titled Chicago, which currently stands at over 8 million views. The song compares Stockholm to the home of drill music Chicago, and has appropriately themed lyrics about guns and violence. But more specifically, the song begins with lyrics where Yassin mentions multiple Shotter's members by name, including Faye, A, and Poi. He also makes reference to a garage 
garage and sending someone to Alar. The garage reference was taken by some to refer to the murder of their death patrol rival Kara just some months earlier, with there even being fan theories on social media that Yassin may have been the shooter. In the second verse, Yassin continues to refer to his shot as gang, saying, rest in peace Indiana, who was killed in the cafe in Rinkaby as well as showing a picture of him in the music video, and going on to shout out yet another member, his manager Frankie aka Faye, who sits next to him in the video. In that music video, Yassine is wearing the same scarf as in the earlier social media post, and there are several people in the background whose faces are blurred out. Now it seems that Yassine was taking full advantage of his status as a gang-related wanted man by the police, but despite the clout that he was picking up in the gangster rap scene, all of this attention would wind up being a liability, and not long after that video's release, Yassine would be arrested. Like Jafar, Yassine was convicted of firearms offences, as well as other smaller crimes, and sent to prison. For a rapper on his way to the top of the Swedish rap scene, going to prison was undoubtedly a huge setback, but at the time, Yassine couldn't have known that this prison sentence would likely save his life, as soon the deadly violence would continue, this time spilling even beyond the borders of Sweden. Coming into 2019, the only core member of the Death Patrol who wasn't locked up was Makalele, aka Maka, who had recently completed his sentence for the firearm offence. Even though the prosecutor reportedly wanted him jailed immediately after the filmed assault of Jafar, even with all of that on camera, once again, there was seemingly not enough evidence to actually convict him. After getting out, Makalele began gathering the remaining Death Patrol members, who had largely formed the younger generation of the Yerva boys that the core Death Patrol members had recruited, who were also going by the name the Hulster children. This included people like Makalele's little brother AZ, and his friends Panda and Abe, who idolised the older guys in the gang and wanted to replicate their gangster image in the streets. However, with many of the main people from both sides of the war being out of the picture, for a moment it seemed like things may have cooled down a little bit. In March, Shobra is released from jail after the police failed to tie him to the large drug bust that took down Musa and Talak. Sometime after, he seemingly returns to Spain to maintain his connections down there. Even with all of the police attention, the members of both of these gangs were global and seemingly able to move between borders freely. Unfortunately, this would mean the downfall for certain members on both sides. As in June 2019, Yassine's manager Faye, aka Frankie, travels to Denmark together with two other Shotters members, Gucci and Hoods, with the apparent aim of meeting local people there from the rap music business. In reality, it would turn out that they had been tricked by Makalele and his crew, who end up ambushing the trio at a parking lot in Herlev, a suburb on the outskirts of Denmark's capital, Copenhagen. Makan and his crew would begin shooting at their car with an automatic rifle and handguns. Faye and Hoods would take off running, and Hoods is able to escape unharmed, but Faye would be hit in the thigh, beginning to bleed profusely while running away from the shooters. He would jump into a bush and hide there, managing to get away from the shooters who returned to their car. There, Gucci, who was unable to escape, would fall into the grass near the car with severe gunshot wounds. At that point, a man runs back to the car and returns fire with an automatic rifle, shooting Gucci over a dozen times more from close distance, killing him on the spot, whilst another attacker filmed it. After the shooting, the Death Patrol members can be seen on video jumping into their car and speeding off from the scene, leaving Gucci's body on the ground to be found by police, whilst Faye is bleeding out nearby, later passing away from his injuries. Their getaway car would later be found intact after an unsuccessful attempt to light it on fire. Now the failure to burn this car that was used in the murder would turn out to be a costly mistake, providing the Danish investigators ample DNA evidence. A few days later, the Denmark police would get a tip that one of the shooters is hiding in an apartment in the city of Aarhus, around three hours away from the crime scene. And there, they end up catching up with none other than Makalele, who was filmed by a bystander whilst attempting to avoid the capture by hanging from a balcony. Four weeks later, the other suspects would all be caught back in Stockholm, Sweden, at which point they were swiftly extradited back to Denmark, beginning a long wait for trial. The death patrol at this point had been written about in the media for several years, but the shocking events in Denmark cemented their notoriety in the media. In a country where such gangster celebrities were a relatively new phenomenon, the discourse would sometimes reach bizarre levels. For example, this insane column would be written that pondered whether the Gucci brand had some kind of responsibility to act and condemn members of the Death Patrol who often dressed in the designer brand. When it finally came time for the trial and sentencing, the Death Patrol members would find out just how bad they messed up by crossing the border to commit these murders. Denmark has been much quicker to act with regards to their own gang problems, and the country would have much harsher penalties for these gangsters than Sweden, with law in certain cases allowing the sentence to be doubled if the crime is proven to be gang-related. In the end, Macan and the two other older members 
would end up getting life sentences, whilst two younger guys, who were still both 17 years old at the time of the crime, would end up getting 20 years each. In Sweden, the younger members, or 100 guys, would have likely received much more lenient sentences, typically three or four years in a youth home. However, as of 2022, due to these laws that prevented underage people from getting serious prison time, Swedish laws are now being rewritten due to the exploitation of these young offenders as hitmen. However, even in Denmark, the sentences of the youngest members made history by being the first sentences of that length being given to underage offenders. This set a clear example for other gangsters to think twice before bringing their armed conflict across their borders. However, after an appeal, the youngsters' sentences were eventually lowered to 16 years, but still, this is multiples more than they would have received had they done the murders in Sweden. Unfortunately, even these sentences haven't been enough to stop the gang from further operating in Denmark, and the Danish news would go on to report that the death squad had actually built official alliances with local gang sets there. But for now, it seemed that Sweden's most dangerous gangsters had been taken off the streets funnily enough, thanks to the Danish authorities. However, naturally, this wouldn't be the end of the warfare, and moving forward, the remaining members of the Shotters and the Death Patrol would continue their bloody campaign for Get Back. Back in the suburbs of Rinkeby, Schotter's members were enraged after the murders of Fay and Gucci, and it was clear that somebody would have to pay in blood. With the Swedish news reporting the authorities had labelled the gang situation as a code red, and describing a revenge spiral that had resulted in yet more murders in the community. In the following weeks, there were several violent incidents taking place in Yerva. In one of these incidents, a Death Patrol affiliate was beaten badly and a video of the attack was posted online. And then, one night in August, the younger generation of the Shotters, or the so-called filterless guys, ended up allegedly running into a brother of a Death Patrol member called Capone. After beating the brother up, they forced him to call Capone and ask him to come to where they were, a wooded area in Tensta. But Capone worked out what was going on, refusing to come, knowing likely what would happen to him. Later on, Capone's brother would be found shot to death in that wooded area. The police would later allegedly arrest five people suspected of being involved in the murder, one of these men allegedly being Hoods, who had just survived the Death Patrol's assassination attempt in Denmark. But once again, there wasn't enough evidence, and no one would be charged in the end. However, years later, in 2022, Yassin would rap in the song V4, implying that Hoods had indeed gotten some get back. In November 2019, Yassin was released from prison after finishing his sentence for the firearm and other lesser offences. While he had been locked up, the Swedish gangster rap scene had exploded, partly due to Einar's huge popularity. And even from behind bars, Yassin had also become one of the country's most popular artists. Shortly after his release, Yassin headed to Milano, Italy with his friends, including alleged shot as members, to shoot a big budget music video for his new song, DSGIS, which translates to What is Hidden in Snow. Yassin begins the song by calling to free a bunch of shot as members including JB, aka Jafar Bin, and Far, the brother of Faye, who had been doing a long sentence while the war in Rinkaby had been raging. In the music video, there's a number of other Shotters members present, such as Yusin's longtime friend Poi, aka Vincent. In December, he would release an EP with the hilarious title, which translates to Hand Under Mona Lisa's Skirt, where he again shouts out Far, as well as saying Rest in Peace Frankie, aka Faye. And then, in a surprising turn of events, only a few days after this EP's release, Right before New Year's Eve, Poi, who had just featured in Yassin's music video, was found in a car at a parking lot in Rinkaby with multiple gunshot wounds. He was taken to a hospital, but his condition was severe, eventually only being kept alive with a ventilator. And sadly, the following day, his father would post on Facebook, revealing that his son had indeed passed away. Shortly after Poi was found, the police arrested several people, two near the scene and others in a car near downtown Stockholm. One of the people arrested in the car was Yassin himself, with news reporting the arrest of the Swedish rap star. Apparently, all of the arrested were members of the Shotters gang. Yassin explained to police that he had actually been sitting in the car with Poi when suddenly someone had opened the door on the driver's side, shooting Poi. Yassin claimed that he would then take off running, believing that he had been the true target of the attack. Yassin was found to have some gunshot residue on him, which made his story seem questionable, but that alone didn't really help the police understand what had happened. And in spring of 2020, Yassin and the rest of the Shotters members were finally released due to a lack of evidence. But that didn't stop rumours that Poi had actually been killed due to an internal conflict within the gang, with the news even pointing out the peculiar detail that Poi's name was not celebrated on social media following his death, and that fellow Shotters didn't contact his family with condolences. Soon after this, Yassin would release his debut album, 980111, named after his birthday. The album again has several Shotters references, like in the song Young and Heartless, 
where Yassine once again shout outs his murdered friend and manager Frankie, aka Faye, as well as describing how the Shotters are Stockholm's finest gangsters. There's also other songs where he talks about how his brothers are trying to even the score and leave people brainless. This album was a huge success and reached number one on Sweden's top album chart, holding the position for four weeks. But while Yassine was enjoying his freedom as one of Sweden's top rappers, the events in the gang world that he described in his songs continued to escalate. Despite their main ops from the Death Patrol now largely being locked up, in July 2020, Shaki, who had killed Hamza in the pizza place in Rinkaby at the beginning of 28, and was now spending his last moments in the youth home where he had been sentenced, was helped to escape the youth home by two accomplices during a supervised leave. And then, in August, Shobra was once again arrested in Spain, this time with his brother, nicknamed City, both who were suspected of organising a large smuggling operation for the Death Patrol. Also in August, another Shotters affiliated member was shot to death in Rinkaby by two people on a motorbike, in what Swedish police described as an execution of a gang leader. The victim was a man called Captain, who was an alleged leader of the Shotters' younger faction, the so-called FLG or filterless guys. The murder was rumoured to have been connected to their beef with another gang, the Husby's Hyenas, from the nearby suburb of Husby. Interestingly, Yassin, not too long ago, had done a song together with the rapper Dre Low, who was allegedly a prominent affiliate of the gang from Husby. Reportedly, the police were looking into a recent music video that the rapper had released about a week before the murder, a music video which appeared to portray the murder plot, with one scene where three men are looking at a photo of their future victim on a phone screen with the police trying to determine if the person shown on the phone screen was in fact Captain. Apparently the image was ultimately too blurry to make any definitive conclusions, but this video seemingly sent a message. It appeared that the conflicts in the suburbs of Yerva were getting increasingly messy and complex, with Swedish news describing the Husby hyenas being at war with the filterless guys, and suggesting that children had been given money and weapons to wage war by the older members. In the midst of all of this violence in the streets, unsurprisingly, the gangster rap wave in Sweden was booming. In October, Yassine released another album, More to Life, which came with an interesting cover depicting himself bloodied with a back full of arrows. The album continues on the same gangster rap style as his earlier releases, although with a much more mainstream sound. Still, in the song On Sight, he would rap in the chorus how the war remains active and how he's a criminal for life, implying that this gang war will continue going on and on. However, already the next month, he would release a song with a singer called Miriam Bryant, with a title translating to Give Up Again, a genuine mainstream pop song which received huge mainstream success, actually becoming number one on Spotify Sweden's top 50 list, with almost half a million plays in 24 hours and maintaining the top spot for weeks. Soon after this, Yassin would appear on the Swedish public service broadcaster show focused on pop culture, where he would indicate that he had left the criminal gang life behind for good at this point. It seemed that finally, at the height of his career, Yassin may have actually been able to escape the gang life that took so many of his friends in such a short time. But unfortunately, not long after, exactly one year after Poi's death on New Year's Eve, Yassine was once again arrested. But this time, the reason was even more surprising, as he was suspected of taking part in a plot to kidnap the rival up-and-coming rap star, Einar. And it's hard to explain just how serious this situation is. These were two of the biggest gang-affiliated rap stars in Sweden at this point, with one Reddit post describing the situation as if Drake had been arrested for the kidnapping of Travis Scott, or the Tory and Megan shooting situation, only much wilder. The baby-faced Swedish gangster rapper Einar had built a serious buzz for himself in the years preceding his tragic fate. However, his position in the gangster rap scene and his proximity to real gangsters running the suburbs of Sweden was both part of the appeal and a serious threat. Spending time during his come-up in the Darlan district in Stockholm, he would rub shoulders with infamous street crew, the Darlan Network, building a friendship with an alleged former leader of the Darlan Network, Paki, who became Einar's manager, along with another alleged member called Chapo. As you now know, in 2018, Paki would be killed, with the allegations that Chapo was responsible ultimately leading to a trial where Chapo would beat all the charges. And now you know more about the bloody and years-long gang war that followed, it's no surprise then that Einar's position at the top of the Swedish drill community would be contentious. The later rumours were that the Dalen network, who allegedly were involved in the early career of Einar, had become resentful towards the rapper after his career had blown up. Apparently, they had been left out of lucrative deals. Later, extensive police reports would reveal exactly what had happened. Much of these revelations were based on the fact that just as Einar's kidnapping was being planned, the police in Europe had gained access to messages between thousands of criminals who had been using an encrypted communication network made by the company called EncroChat. These messages showed that between the 30th and 31st of March 2020, Yassine was working together with members from both the Dalen and Vorbi networks to kidnap Einar. Yassine's job in the plan was to lure Einar, who thought that the two were on good terms with him, to a location where he could be kidnapped. Later messages would provide a shocking revelation. When one of the people 
people involved in the plan would write a message saying that Yassin will do Einar like Poi, implying that Yassin had indeed lured his childhood friend out the night that he was murdered. However, on the night that Yassin was supposed to lure Einar to a specific location, he would get paranoid after he was stopped by the police in the early morning of the 31st of March during a visit to a 7-Eleven. After a taxi driver had reported giving a ride to a group of nervously acting men who possibly had a weapon, after this search, at this stop, the police would indeed find a gun on Yassin. But this gun would turn out actually to be a replica which Yassin had claimed he was only carrying for a music video shoot. Also that night, another gang member involved in the plan, a former youth soccer star, Ilya Djokovic, who had played in Sweden's under-17 national team before suffering an injury and getting deep into the gang life with the Vorbi network, would find the police snooping around his apartment, making him suspicious. After these events, the gang would decide to abort the initial kidnapping plan. A few days later, the leader of the Vorbi network, Jihab Lamauri, would indicate that they had located his longtime nemesis, Mekil Yokana, and Yassin was notified that Einar's kidnapping plans were to be put on hold. In reality, however, the plans moved on, but this time with the help of the rapper Haval. It was now Haval's turn, together with members of the Dalan network that Einar had previously associated with, to lure Einar into a specific apartment where members of the Vorbi network would be waiting. Astonishingly, shortly after midnight on the 15th of April, as Haval, Einar, and members of the Dalan network, including the leader, Mario Golzarmia, were driving towards the apartment, the police would once again make a stop. Unfortunately, everyone in the car seemed to be in good spirits at this point, and after telling the crew to kick one person out of the car to bring the number of people traveling in it to a safe five passengers, the cops then allowed them to continue their journey. This stop by the police happened only 100 meters away from their destination. Inside the apartment they were going to, members of the Vorbi network were waiting, armed with the various weapons, as well as props, that they were planning on using to humiliate Einar. Once again, in another shocking display of brutality that I have never seen in any gang story from Australia to Chicago, these gangsters would hold Einar captive, forcing him to dress up in women's clothing and drink from a dog bowl amid beatings whilst photographs were taken. The motive was to use these photos to extort the rapper for money. They would also post a photo of a gun and a Rolex day date that they had seemingly taken from Einar. After the members of the Vorbi network were done humiliating and torturing Einar, he was then taken by Haval and some others to a location where he would further hand them a gun and two golden chains, which Haval would then proudly wear in a picture posted to an accomplice. Shockingly, a music video featuring both Haval and Einar would be dropped the very next day on April the 16th, along with the rapper Abidaz, making it seem as if nothing had happened between them. But in reality, things were far from fine. And after the kidnapping, the members were also planning on planting a bomb at Einar or one of his family members' homes, with the police reports mentioning how guys like Mario Golzarmia were stopped by the police near Einar's house in the weeks following the kidnapping. Then, in May, the perpetrators made the decision that their extortion plan was not going to work, and these pictures of Einar were published on social media through various channels. However, according to the police, an Instagram account by the name of Shobra the Don, named after the real Instagram account of Shobra from the Death Patrol, may well have been the first account to post these photos. This same account also tagged the location in some of these pictures as Rinkaby and posted a censored photo of three Death Patrol members, including Shaki, who was still in closed youth care for the murder of Hamza, and Abe, who was already arrested for the murders of Faye and Gucci. Seemingly, this was a half-hearted attempt to actually frame the Death Patrol for the crime, or perhaps it was just trolling. On the popular Swedish discussion forum Flashback, which also acts as a kind of Swedish version of Shyrakology, where real crime and gang-related cases are discussed in depth. The news of Einar's kidnapping quickly became a popular topic on the forum, with rumors spreading that Einar was even assaulted in the attack, with many trolls on the forum taking the news with glee. Some people were happy about what had happened to Einar, due to the fact that a lot of his haters felt that he was faking his gangster image and suggesting that he had now gotten a real taste of the lifestyle that he claimed to live, with one commenter saying, thug life, surely that's what he wanted, now he got his way, congratulations. There was also immediately much speculation about who had been behind the kidnapping, with one of the first suspects rather randomly being none other than Leo Chinese Carmona the founder of Sweden's first gangster rap group, Cartellen, the cartel. However, despite numerous possible culprits being discussed and speculated about, the rumors that the Death Patrol was behind the kidnapping were immediately shut down. Einar himself would reply to the media storm with a short video where he simply stated, anyone can get kidnapped, and that this wasn't going to change or stop anything. Yo, 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 behind the Instagram, yo. Your brother here. Wallah, I will... I have one thing to say to you. All of you can be kidnapped. All of you can be slagged. All of you can be... I don't know what, bro. Benny, man, it's good. You see, I'm alive. And no one can do what I do. So I'm going to continue as long as I stop. Then, in July 2020, a rapper called Maki dropped a music video where Haval can be seen hanging in the background. In one scene, Haval can be seen in a car with another rapper named Euro, who lifts up 
up two gold chains and a watch that were rumoured to be the ones stolen from Einar during the kidnapping. Later, the police reports would reveal that Euro, real name Idris Yusuf, had also been stopped by the police during Einar's kidnapping near the apartment where Einar had been taken, with his role likely being that of a lookout. This brazen exhibition of stolen chains would continue about one week later, when Haval dropped a music video for his new song, Controls It, where he likely can be seen wearing the two stolen chains as well as a watch. These rather subtle flexes by the perpetrators were missed by many fans and online detectives following the case, but not by the police who were following their every move after having received the Encro chat logs in the spring of 2020, likely shortly after the kidnapping had taken place. Then, in September, they moved in and arrested the ex-footballer Ilya Jok together with several other people from the Volby network. In early December, it was reported that Haval was also in custody, followed by Yassin, who would be arrested at the end of the month. The media was not reporting which rapper Yassin was accused of kidnapping, although the fact that it was Einar was obvious to anybody familiar with what was going on. But his arrest, at the height of his career, caused a major public debate about the influence of the new wave of gangster rappers in Sweden, particularly right-wing politicians who demanded that Yassin's music should be removed from streaming platforms like Spotify, as well as suggesting that he should be banned from all musical award ceremonies. Meanwhile, more left-leaning voices argued about how this gangster rap in Sweden had become an artistic way to reflect on the real surroundings of people from poor backgrounds coming up in these areas. Ultimately, the gang war was heavily impacting the music industry at this point, whether the authorities, politicians or newspapers liked it or not. The battles between these famous gang-affiliated rappers had become like a twisted reality show that Swedish citizens were following with sick interest. Unfortunately, however, for the actual rappers and gangsters involved, this was not a game and naturally, escalation wouldn't be far behind, as ultimately, revenge would be taken for these despicable acts, leading to yet more deadly bloodshed on the streets of Sweden. Following the kidnapping of Einar and the arrest of the kidnappers, Einar himself kept it street and refused to cooperate in the investigation, and the leaked pictures from the humiliation ritual seemed to have little if any effect on his popularity, which was only growing. Whilst his old industry friends were fighting their case, Einar would continue showing off his luxurious lifestyle on social media, seemingly replacing his stolen watches with a whole collection of Rolexes and showing off luxury vacations and his time spent driving Lamborghinis. In a way, Einar was taunting his rivals and showing that he was doing better than ever, despite their best efforts. Moreover, this kidnapping wouldn't make Einar disassociate with the streets, but rather get far more involved, with rumours actually spreading that he was hanging out with various different gangs following his kidnapping and even buying protection from some of them, not dissimilar to Takeshi69 before he ended up getting busted including possibly heavy hitters like the Breedang Getwork and Bandito's Motorcycle Gang, who were infamous in the streets of Sweden for a string of bombings. Einar was also still associating himself with many of the allegedly gang-affiliated rappers such as 50 and Mowgli, who were allegedly in the Bro Network, from Uplands Bro in North Stockholm. This gang has become infamous in recent years for their affiliations with the Foxtrot Gang, who have been estimated to run one of the largest drug smuggling and distribution operations in Sweden, with one bus concerning a conspiracy to smuggle a whopping 800 kilos of dope. Foxtrot has also been entangled in extremely violent clashes in recent years with other large gangs, including the Darlan Network, who was seemingly directly responsible for Einar's kidnapping as well as going through a bloody internal conflict. Now, the gang was rumoured to have been led by a man named Rawa Majid, the name Rawa being close to the Swedish word Rev, which means fox, where the name Foxtrot stems from. Majid is also more commonly known in the media by his nickname, the Kurdish Fox. Einar also collaborated with a rapper called One Cuz, who received unexpected international fame when he got a shout out from Ed Sheeran during a 2022 Breakfast Club interview. There's a, a, a Swedish a Swedish rapper I was listening to the other day called One Cuz, and it, you know he raps in Swedish, but I still I still feel it. Feel still it like, yeah. One Cuz is alleged to have been affiliated with a gang called the Lions, a gang hailing from the Hesselby Gorge suburb in northwestern Stockholm a gang which has since allegedly split into two rival gangs after an internal conflict, which I'm not going to get into here. But after doing a prison bid for getting caught with some heavy weaponry, one cuz would claim to have left the streets behind him, focusing instead on his music career and collaborating with various mainstream celebrities like Ed Sheeran himself, who actually linked up with one cuz on the track Two Step. One cuz has even been associated with the infamous climate activist Greta Thunberg. However, in spite of saying that he left the gang life behind, references to the gang lifestyle have remained a steady part of his music going forward. In his recent music video for the song Trauma Paranoia, one cuz can even be seen hanging out in both Hesselby Gord and Rinkaby with a large gang. And at one point in the video, a masked man can be seen pointing towards the infamous pizza place in Rinkaby where Hamza was killed. And at the end of the video, one cuz can be seen posting with the same man in front of the pizza place, making it seem as if the masked man is somehow connected with the murder that took place there. Indeed, one cuz would also post a photo on Instagram where he's hanging out with none other than Shaki, the young Death Patrol member 
who killed Hamza at the pizza place. This would cause one cuz to receive some questionable media coverage, with Swedish news reporting a sensational headline calling out Greta Thunberg for socialising with a Death Patrol killer. With this negative press perhaps being the reason that the official YouTube video of that song has been deleted from YouTube. When it comes to the Death Patrol, it seemed that Einar too was increasingly spending time with people who had connections to the gang and their affiliates, including the Death Patrol affiliate Doomla and rappers Adel and ZE, who are both from the Yerva area. Adel too has been associated in the past with the Death Patrol and the Huspies Hyenas, both enemies of the Shotters. Einar was also not shunning away from rapping about his enemies. In the songs after his kidnapping, he would seemingly often sneak diss the people involved. For example, in one song, with the title translating roughly to put them in their place, released in February 2021, Einar raps about about becoming the most streamed artist in Sweden and people who used to be his friends betraying him because of jealousy, as well as referencing former friends who want to see him dead. After this, in April, Einar would put out his most pointed diss with his feature on the song Voy by rapper Danny M. About a week before the song was released, a young man was shot to death in the suburb of Kista. This man would turn out to be the little brother of Haval, the man accused of setting up the kidnapping of Einar. According to reports, the killers in this murder had actually fled the scene on electric scooters, with Voy, the title of that song, in fact being a popular brand of rentable e-scooters in Stockholm. In the chorus of the song, Danny and Einar rap about a body laying on the ground like a ditch scooter, rapping the lyrics, come get your boy. And the imagery of a scooter laying on the ground is seen in the cover artwork for the song. And Einar would actually end his verse with lyrics that seemingly imply his role in a murder for hire plot, rapping that a young'un will take one for the team and shoot someone and their friend, and that his new team is planning more than just getting famous, followed by gunshot sounds. The release of this scooter themed song, so soon after the scooter to aided murder would start rumours that Einar may have ordered the murder as revenge for his kidnapping, and much later, alleged leaked DMs between Danny and Haval were posted on social media after Haval had supposedly gotten this song dissing his murdered brother removed from Spotify. But while Einar was seemingly bragging about get back for his kidnapping, the authorities would be getting back for it too. In July 2021, Yassin and Haval were finally found guilty for their parts in the kidnapping, and they were sentenced to prison. Haval for two and a half years, and Yassin for just ten months. A few months later, in September, Einar would drop a new song Dancer or Dance with the rapper Adam, where he seemingly once again takes shots at Haval and his murdered brother. Also in September, newspapers report how a drunken rapper had tried to take a police officer's gun while he was being detained, ending in him getting tased. Different sources seem to put Einar, together with his rapper friends Adel and ZE, all at the scene, with suggestions that the altercation had taken place during a raid on a party that they were attending. Then, the next month on October the 9th, 2021, newspapers would report how two famous rappers had been arrested following a stabbing in a restaurant. The newspapers would also report that the victim belonged to the Husby's Hyenas gang and that the stabbing was gang related. And rumours would later circulate, suggesting that Einar, together once again with Adel and ZE, were all at the scene of the stabbing. It seemed that despite Einar's massive mainstream success and previous entanglements with gang members, his life was still heading in an increasingly violent direction. And unfortunately, only about two weeks later, on October the 21st, it would all come to an end. That night, Einar was out once again, hanging out with Adel as well as Doomla, who had recently begun making music himself. They were in the wealthy Hammerby Scherstad neighbourhood in central Stockholm, where Einar had gotten an apartment. As the trio was exiting a bike storage room at the yard of Einar's apartment building after an apparent smoke session, two assailants would approach them with guns and begin shooting, making Adel and Einar begin to run in different directions, while Doomla would supposedly go back into the bike storage. Einar ran into a courtyard and was seemingly heading towards the door of the building, but would reportedly choose the wrong door where his key fob didn't work. At this point, he would be shot several times from close distance. Soon after, people in and around the apartments would arrive to try and help him, with some seemingly realising that this was a famous rapper deciding to film his final moments on the ground, which would soon end up going viral on the internet. Meanwhile, people from the other side seemingly celebrating and posted the picture of Einar dead on the ground with the caption, Free Haval. That very night, people on the internet would get the information, with members of the Death Patrol seemingly confirming the murder of Sweden's biggest drill rapper. And the next morning, the whole of Sweden would wake up to the news in the media about his murder. Immediately, speculation would also begin about exactly what had happened, with news reporting about threats that Einar had received on social media in the days leading up to his death. The news would even claim that money had been put on his head following the recent stabbing incident, and it was that event that apparently made Einar particularly fearful for his life. 
The witnesses also said that the killers themselves were actually the ones who had seemingly filmed the body of Einar after shooting him, with some wild claims even suggesting that the killers had actually broadcasted the entire execution to other gang members via FaceTime live, implying that these were actually contract killers who needed live proof of the job being done. There would even be videos circulating where two masked men seemingly claimed the murder whilst listening to that song Voy by Einar and Danny M, where Einar had supposedly dissed Haval's dead younger brother. However, despite an intensive investigation, the shooters of Einar were not caught, and soon the focus amongst fans and the media turned to the few facts that were known clearly, like the fact that the people that were with Einar at the time of his death, Adel and Dumala, with many asking how did the killers know where and when to hit Einar. Einar's address and other personal information were secret due to the threats against his safety and the kidnapping case as well as his popularity in the city. But this address had reportedly been leaked after he became a suspect in a drug investigation. However, even more puzzling, had the killers not arrived when the trio was outside smoking, they would have had very few ways to actually reach Einar, who reportedly lived in a secure building that required a key fob access to enter. So the only explanation then was that someone with Einar must have told the killers when to pull up. Soon, the online detectives would quickly point their fingers towards the Death Patrol affiliate, Mehdi Dumla Sashir, with speculation that somebody had written on Instagram two years before, warning Einar that his friends might sell him out. Indeed, they would also point out that this wouldn't be the first time that Dumla had possibly betrayed a supposed friend and tricked them into their death. On the 30th of June 2019, a rapper by the name of Roz was shot to death in front of his home. Soon after, newspapers would report how an arrest had been made in the case, which linked the killers to the Death Patrol. The person arrested would turn out to be Dumla. The police reports would reveal how Roz's mum had explained to the police how Roz's brother had been killed in a gang-related incident in 2018, and ever since Roz had begun rapping, he had often spoken about avenging his brother's death, upsetting the gang members allegedly responsible for the murder. And then Mehdi, aka Dumla, had suddenly appeared in his life, and soon after, Roz had been killed, with the implication being that Dumla, who had a relationship with the people that Roz was talking about getting back at in his music, had sold him out. Indeed, according to Roz's girlfriend, it was Dumla who called him right before he stepped outside and got shot. The police would eventually catch Roz's killer, but there wasn't enough evidence to tie Dumla into the case. However, when Dumla himself was asked about the online theories regarding his role in Einar's murder, he would deny having anything to do with it, calling it speculation. However, after Einar's murder, the Swedish media would get interested in Dumla too, and one of the largest evening newspapers in the country, The Expressen, would publish an in-depth interview with him where Dumla told about his life as an alleged Death Patrol member, and even shockingly telling the Swedish public to just let the gang members kill each other until there are none left, suggesting that it's not the middle and upper class people who die in the gang war, but just the people at the bottom who have made a problem for themselves. Stadiet som konflikten är i nu mellan Schottas och Dödspatrullen. Mm. Finns det någon lösning där? Nej. Det finns ingen lösning. Det finns ingen lösning på den alltså. Tis, tis, tis folk ska dö. Folk dör ju. Mm. Och då mammor som förlorar sina söner, pappor, sina, sina barn också. Och ett helt samhälle som blir påverkat av att ni är några killar som skjuter varandra och mördar varandra. Mm. Är det rimligt att fortsätta den banan? Det låter inte rimligt, men... Ja, det låter inte rimligt, men... Men... Folk måste gå till. This interview would anger the right-wing media pundits who saw it as glorifying gang life. Moreover, they would point out that Dumla had one particular crime in his past which was so horrendous that it should disqualify him completely from getting any kind of publicity in any context. Months after Einar's murder, in May 2022, a newspaper would report that a man with a known gang affiliation who knew Einar was suspected of aiding and abetting his murder. This man would allegedly turn out to be Dumla. But then, on the morning of Christmas Day 2022, as Dumla was outside on his home turf in Rinkeby, he too was shot in an execution-style attack, passing away on Christmas. A few days later, a YouTube channel dropped Doomla's only music video where he actually ends the song himself, saying, rest in peace, Einar. It appears that Einar's murder himself has become a cold case, where the police appear to strongly believe that they know who ordered the murder and who committed it and who set it up 
But as seems to be a trend in this story and this country, they simply don't have enough evidence to charge anyone. Most shocking are the theories about one of the likely shooters, who is thought to have been one of Einar's old childhood friends, who goes by the name of Scar, with both of them seemingly growing up together around Darlin. Scar is thought to have become a contract killer for the Darlin network, who Einar had been beefing ever since his kidnapping. And while the police have struggled to find evidence to charge Scar, or others allegedly associated with the murder, media and online detectives have published theories of a large-scale revenge taking place in the streets in the aftermath of Einar's murder, that began with the murder of Doomler and includes a spiral of at least eight public acts of violence, including a murder, two shootings, and five bombings, two of which targeted Scar directly, and one, a bombing allegedly targeting the home of Haval. According to different sources, both Haval and Yassin have since moved out of Sweden permanently, following their release from prison after finishing their sentences for the participation in the kidnapping of Einar. The reasons seem obvious, given the violence unraveling around them. However, this hasn't stopped Haval from continuing to diss Einar, as in the summer of 2023, Haval teased a new song to his fans where he seemingly implies witnessing a murder via FaceTime whilst in prison. Just like the police had theorized about Einar's case, he would eventually drop the controversial song under the name of Southside. And then, a few months later, on Einar's death day, Haval would also post a picture of him smoking with a skeleton, sending a clear message about his feelings towards Einar even long after his death. In the aftermath of Einar's murder, the violence continues and the war in Rinkeby just gets worse and worse, largely moving past the older generations of the Shotters versus the Death Patrol to an increasingly deadly clash between the younger generations of the Holster Children and Filterless Guys. Together with the younger guys from gangs like the Huspies Hyenas and Headshot League from the nearby suburbs, who had all grown up in this environment where gangs, guns and death had become the new normal. The national media, who had become enamoured with the gangs during the original conflict between the Death Patrol and the Shotters, has continued reporting on the war in great detail, focusing particularly on stories around a few notorious members, such as two guys from the Holster Children, who go by the name Sixty and Fishy. With this duo, both having the letters SK allegedly standing for Shotters Killers tattooed on their hands. They were likely recruited by the older members of the Death Patrol whilst they were still in high school, but since, they have apparently taken over the streets of Rinkeby and raised hell in the Yerva area during the 2020s, even being described in YouTube videos as Sweden's deadliest duo and being rumoured to have been connected to numerous shootings and murders, with 60 alone apparently being suspected of dozens of crimes within just a few years' time. In 2022, they were finally found guilty in relation to two murders that took place in 2021. The first of these murders has been alleged to have been a contract killing, showing just how this younger generation has continued on the path started by the original Death Patrol, whilst the second one is alleged to have been part of the war with the Filterless Guys, where Sixty had allegedly shot two members of the rival gang who had arrived to his apartment with the attention of killing him following an earlier shooting that same day. According to author and journalist Diamant Saliu, who has written a book about the conflict between the Death Patrol and the Shotters, the out of control killing in areas like Yerva can be at least partly explained with the lack of structure in the local gangs. In that sense, the problems in Sweden actually kind of follow the common trends in places like Chicago, where the fracturing of former large gangs with strict leadership structures into smaller neighbourhood cliques without any real leadership after the demolition of many of the project buildings that house these organised gangs has led to an increasingly chaotic and senseless gang warfare, where alliances and enemies between a handful of lost youths can lead to senseless murders at a moment's notice over the smallest of disagreements. On the other hand, much like in Chicago, where the murder rate was in fact its highest during the reign of the large and hierarchical gangs, also in Sweden, the more organised gangs have in recent years shown that they too are capable of inflicting brutal violence on their enemies enemies as well as innocent victims. It remains to be seen whether the current or future governments in Sweden, whether right-wing or left, are going to be able to solve this issue. But in order to find a long-lasting solution, they will have to solve the core issue of why so many kids in Sweden now feel that the path of gangs and crime is the only one where they can find meaning. For Yassin, it seems that he has finally been able to move past that mindset, focusing instead on his rap career and raising a family far away from the dangers of Rinkeby. But others, like Einar, were not so lucky. And the sad truth is that no matter what country you come from, the fine line between gangster rapper and gang member must be walked carefully. Because just one wrong step can be the difference between fame and glory or an early grave. I hope you found that story interesting. I learned a lot researching it, and it really made me think about drill music from a global perspective and how these issues affect different communities all over the world, no matter what country you're from or what language you speak. Once again, I mean no disrespect by this story, and rest in peace. 
everybody who I covered that lost their lives.